Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today I would like to tell you about equivalence or what equality means. And this in the end will be equivalence of categories, but I will take a kind of more broader perspective and explain a little bit the idea between kind of varying the concept of what is equal. And yeah, so equal is kind of a very vague concept in some sense, also is very precise on this on the other hand. But for category theory, it turns out, and also for other parts of mathematics and maybe other parts of the sciences and maybe life itself, it turns out to be actually not the correct way of doing things um, in a certain way. Whatever correct means, obviously, it always depends a little bit on your problem. So let's have a look, actually. So when I first learned about mathematics, which is now ages ago, I'm just ridiculously old, um, I really thought like mathematics, that's the science of right? Mathematics is a science of equality. You want to write down whatever, something like that. I hope that's not too fancy mathematics. Two plus two equals four. So the point is this little sign, right? So this is crucial. Um, so that's what I thought all the time. Mathematics is a science of equality, right? In some sort of sense, mathematics is a science of equality. Here's another example. So in the real world, um, it's probably good enough to just say pi is three, whatever that's that's good enough that's good enough for the real world anyway so for most real world examples where we ever need to compute pi maybe you want to do 3.1 or something but but it's pretty good so in the real world you actually might just say pi is three because you can't measure pi anyway um no tool is fine enough to measure up uh, arbitrary digits of pi obviously but in mathematics kind of mathematics here in my own self point of view is the science of equality. And yeah, here you go. The science of equality would say something like pi is equal to some fancy expression. Um, I just found this expression here. I just, I just used it, but of course there are zillions of other formulas for pi. Some of them are quite cute. Some of them are quite ugly. Some of them are quite computable. Some of them are not, depends a little bit. But the point is here that mathematics kind of doesn't want to do the step at pi three. Um, from my perspective, it just could. I don't. I don't really care. But <laughs> some people will probably get very offended if you say pi three. Maybe not offended. I, some people probably get offended. Anyway, I, I should stop because I just said some people get very offended. You will get the point here, right? So it's kind of in some sense, mathematics is a science of equality. That's at least what I always thought. And in some other sense, it's actually not. And it takes you a while to figure that out. So mathematicians might actually maybe write instead of a pi is three, they actually might write pi is approximately three. Right? You just redefine what equality means. Instead of equal, you just write approximately. Or you can be kind of very awake and just write pi is equal to 3.1. And I actually don't know what the next digit of pi is, but it doesn't matter at all. Um, it, it won't be precise anyway, right? It's not really an honest equality what you write here. Um, you kind of redefined equality in that sense. So in some other sense, mathematics actually always was, and I was just too naive and too confused, always was the science of redefining equality. It was never really the science of equality. And here comes a nice way of redefining equality, which kind of turns out plays a really, really crucial role in everything kind of related to algebra in some way or the other, which is isomorphism. Let me recall, or let me introduce what that means. So I have here two groups um, and I define my groups using a multiplication table. Um, the only catch here is I'm actually using an addition table because I write my groups additively, not multiplicatively, but it's kind of the multiplication table of the group. Um, whatever, I should call it the addition table. Anyway, I have my Z mod two here and my addition table it just has two elements, zero and one. And here's my addition table. Uh, maybe the only fancy one is that one plus one is actually a zero. Z mod two, that's what happens with Z mod two. I have another group on the other side, again, defined by the addition table. I call it the fruit group. I'm probably the only one who ever uses this group. But anyway, it has two elements, uh, apple and orange. And here's the addition table. For example, uh, the obvious addition that if you have two oranges, orange plus orange is obviously apple. We all know that, um, obviously. Uh, so this is my fruit group. And then what's the same? They're simply not the same. Why are they not the same? Well, they're not the same sets. One of them contains zero and one, and the other one contains apple and orange. And as far as I know, apple and orange are not zero and one. I think 
probably Apple will get offended and Orange would get offended as well. And I'm not so sure about zero and one, but they're certainly not the same. But the point is, obviously look at the table. Obviously they are the same, right? We need to redefine equality to kind of get rid of this ambiguity of the underlying set. I don't like this ambiguity that underlying set. Just think about it. Formally speaking, if you would write, I would write down on a paper Z mod two, and you would write down on a paper Z mod two. And as a set, they might not be, if you want to take it literally, they might not be the same because they might have, well, I've written on a different paper than you. There will be different molecules involved, blah, 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 blah. So uh, definitely in this sense, the underlying set shouldn't really play a role. What should play a role is the multiplication table, uh, which is an addition table on my slide. I'm so sorry about that. Anyway, the, the main crucial player should be the addition table. And this is obviously the same. What kind of symbols I use is completely unimportant, right? And the formal way we do this is we would say they're equivalent. In this case, case well, the name is isomorphic. Um, the name kind of depends a little bit on uh, kind of the underlying notions you're working with. Uh, but anyway, I will go with equivalent. In this case, really means there's the same up to renaming. So I really don't care what kind of set structure there is underlying, whether you call your elements zero and one, apple and orange, or come up with your own definitions. I don't care as long as you write down the same addition table. Um, that's what, what we want to do, right? The same addition table will do everything. Right? Kind of that's the main point. As soon as kind of we vary the underlying set, certainly in some sense, equality might not be the right thing. So we take this idea that mathematics is a science of redefining equality, and we just say, okay, we take everything up to equivalence or everything up to isomorphism in this case. That kind of a really, really nice idea. I get rid of a different ways of naming your elements by this abstract concept of an isomorphism between groups in this case. And in category theory, you just take everything a step further. Uh, we'll, we'll see why. And that kind of makes sense from the viewpoint of category theory. Category theory kind of takes this bird's eye perspective, and we don't really see any more the underlying sets, right? We, we actually don't see sets anymore. We kind of want to get rid of sets anyway. So we definitely want to work more with kind of equ equivalence type of statements instead of uh, equality. Right? Equality is a wrong concept for category theory. We will see that several times in several different videos. But here's, for example, an example of what we can do. Um, so we have the category of finite sets. What could that be? Well, elements are finite sets, and uh, arrows are maps between finite sets. And here's this funny category that are called F set SK. SK stands for skeleton. Um, let me just define it for you. It's a, it's a category whose objects are just natural numbers and whose arrows are just the corresponding uh, home sets between uh, the finite sets M and N. And the standard notation, what is M as a finite set, is just the set 0 up to M minus 1. And N is just the set 0 up to M minus 1. It's kind of the standard notation in stack theory. Anyway, so what I do here is I reduce. So there's a functor which I call size going from one to the other. You just map all, uh, basically all, not just basically, you map all sets to their sizes and all fancy maps uh, to their corresponding images between, well, the corresponding sets M and N, right? If you really think of it as M and N. It's kind of an absolutely minimal model of the same, they're kind of the same categories, right? So there should be, they should be equal in some sense. And if, in fact, the size functor is an equivalence of categories, which I'm going to explain in a second. In some sense, what's happening here is here are really many objects, many objects, really a lot of objects. And here are sparse, this is really sparse. Almost no objects at all. Well, we have objects labeled by natural, by integers, by natural numbers in on the right hand side. And well, you have quite a few objects on the other hand side. I don't want to go into set theoretical details, but just for one element set, you kind of have infinitely many ways to kind of rename your one element, right? And they're all different sets. And that's what we don't want to do, right? We don't want to see that they are different sets. So in some sense, what's happening here is that set-based mathematics um, would like to do, would like to say something like, this has way more objects. Green 
this one has way more objects than red on the other side. But category theory would rather say, okay, set-based mathematics, who cares? Who cares that there are more objects? I don't care about objects. I don't see their fine structures anyway. As long as you can map them somehow one-to-one -one in a certain sense, I'm good. And this kind of motivates the notion of equivalence, which is, as I said, kind of one step further than even uh, the isomorphism and just forgetting the underlying set, it's going one step further. You also kind of ignore how many there are in this very precise way. Okay, so here comes the definition. So two definitions, kind of the, the, the latter one is the equivalence of categories, and the first one is the, what is an isomorphism actually in a category? In a category, uh, sorry, an isomorphism of categories. And that's crucially different in the following sense. So an isomorphism is just a factor with an inverse, but really simple. Isomorphism is a factor f with an inverse that I just call g, whatever. So g is f inverse. And you would call categories isomorphic, and you would write this symbol as before for an isomorphism of groups. That's kind of the analog of the isomorphism of groups. But that's not quite the right concept. We will see that. And this really, really means, if you just unravel the definitions, that these are, these are bijections on objects and arrows. I should have written arrows. Um, but anyway, there are bijections on objects and arrows, right? bijections on both. And this notion coincides with isomorphism. So there are bijections on both, on objects and arrows. And in category theory, I just kind of, we somehow kind of don't care what happens on objects as long as it's not completely out of control. So we kind of are already happy if there are just bijections on morphisms. And this is where the notion of equivalence comes in, which is a way more important notion in category theory. It's really this idea that those two categories are not isomorphic. One of them has way more objects than the other, but they are still contain kind of the same amount of information from the report of categories, so they're equivalent. So how would you define equivalence? Well, it's really just the same, but instead of writing that they're equal, we're not doing this, uh, the science of equality anymore. We're doing the science of redefining equality. We don't say they're equal, but we say they're naturally isomorphic. So there's a natural isomorphism, a natural transformation, which is an isomorphism from GF and FG to the corresponding identities. So G is not really the inverse. It's kind of a pseudo inverse, if you want, or an inverse up to equivalence. And we call them equivalent in this case. And I write a slightly different symbol. Right? So instead of uh, equality with a twiddle, I just write a straight line with a twiddle. It's kind of a difference. And the point is, this is still good enough for all purposes category theory ever wonders about because I should have written arrows uh, because it's a bijection on arrows, but not necessarily on objects. So this here is an equivalence, size is an equivalence, which is certainly not a uh, bijection on objects. It collapses everything, for example, with one object. Well, here are two different sets with one object. They're both sent to one, right? So it's not in the group, it's not a bijection objects, but on morphisms, it's on more arrows, it's good. And that's why category theory likes it, because we only care about arrows. And if you wonder now, I can never check that in practice. There's actually a very nice way to checking that. Um, that they're just it's just if it's a F is an equivalence if and only if it's fully faithful and essentially subjective. So fully faithful, full means uh, subjective on home spaces, faithful means injective on home spaces. And this funny, essentially subjective means the following. I will explain that in a second on my example. Um, this kind of means it's not too crazy on objects. So for, it's not a bijection on objects, but not too crazy. So for all objects in the image category, there will be an object in the target category such that f of x is not equal to y, but it's isomorphic to y, right? So uh, this one here. And so for each all objects in the target category, there will be something in the uh, source category, which is isomorphic. So here, for example, um, my M actually is the image of this set anyway. So this is how it is defined. So everything in my target category is actually hit by multiple uh, things in the source category. So this is essentially subjective. And checking that it's full and faithful is, is really simple in this case. So this is really an equivalence of category. Okay. Um, and really, coming back to my example, kind of the slogan is a property preserved under equivalence 
is, as this happens, if and only if it doesn't involve any quality equations on objects, so equalities on objects. Why? Well, first of all, we redefine. Well, we have this essentially subjective there, of course, but if we want to redefine um, equality anyway, because we kind of don't care about objects. But this is a, the returning slow wheel in category theory. Arrows are way more important. So on arrows, I said again, it's good, but on objects, it it's just essentially subjective. And that's completely enough for all purposes of category theory anyway. Anyway, so let me wrap up. So I, category theory in particular, as part of mathematics, really redefines equality. So the correct equality between categories is what is called equivalence. And a surprising, a little bit surprising if you see it for the first time, um, part of the definition here is that you do not care that you preserve the objects. You do not have bijections on objects. If you have bijections on arrows, arrows are way more important, so you want to keep bijections on arrows, but you do not have bijections on objects. You have rather this funny statement of being essentially subjective. And equivalence of categories is just more important than the isomorphism of categories, which kind of rarely happens. Right? For example, my categories F sets, so finite sets, and F set SK, they're equivalent, but they're not isomorphic. In any case, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.